This topic, as part of the on-ramp series which we have discussed, is to, you know, a lot of people who are researchers, doing it, engineers, scientists, and this is really meant to be, introduce them to what is business? So, and what do these guys do all day? And what, is it evil? Is it really evil or it's not really that evil? So there's, it's really to demystify some of those myths. So I want to start some very, very basic concepts and so some of you may be too advanced for this. I'm, that's what I'm looking at your faces. You look a little bit too smart. So this may be, so let me just lower your expectations right in the start. It's highly unlikely you'll learn anything new. <laughs> so you know, the, she, 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 she did us a comprehensive intro. I won't bore you with any more detail. But the only thing I want to say is that I am an electrical engineer just like you guys and spent 10 years building chips and systems and designing hardware before taking a detour to learn about high-tech marketing. And then was fortunate enough to then take several companies. So if you have a iPhone 5S or iPhone 6 with a fingerprint sensor, we actually built that technology uh, 15 years ago, sold it to a company which then was bought by Apple. So every time you see an iPhone with a fingerprint sensor, I take a little pride in that. So having done that, been there, uh, what I really want to understand that what is business, just, just at a very ground and basic level. So business is an entity which is designed by its charter to accomplish certain things, and they come in a couple of flavors. Business could be for profit, and that's what the most of the companies are, when your goal is to maximize shareholders' value. So shareholders actually come together, set up a company, and give them objective. And for a for-profit company, the idea is to maximize shareholder value. So the company, the executive team's job is to take whatever necessary steps which are correct steps to take to maximize shareholder value. They're supposed to do that. They're not supposed to do other things. That's why when you hear about CSR, the corporate social responsibility, I sometimes wonder that how does that sit well? Is it really there to look good, or is it a meaningful way they're maximizing the shareholder profit? Now, of course, there is a nonprofit, and nonprofit have very specific objective, again, set up by their charter, like Red Cross. They're supposed to provide you know, relief when there's a disaster. So the charter of the company actually sets forth what the company is supposed to do. So the concept of the, this a company is, is an interesting one. Because for thousands of years, people did business. And people were obliged by, if people had a bad reputation, their business went down. People had a good reputation, business was good. Or you know, there, was, there was one person. But over time, we realized that maybe we need to separate the two. Because sometimes you want to be good, sometimes you want to be bad, sometimes you want to be naughty. It can't be the same person. I, what if I do something terrible and it impacts my business? I need to be able to separate the two. And this is why this concept was created, that what if you can separate the person from another entity? It's a legal entity. Just like a person pays taxes, this legal entity pays taxes. Just like this person can die, but this, thing, this, person, this entity can live. Or this entity can die, and this person can live. What if we can legally separate them? And this is how the concept of setting up a company came together. The company is a legal entity which has its own life, which does its own things. And if company does bad thing, it should not necessarily reflect on the shareholders. I mean, today, if you are I don't know what company is doing bad things today. I, we have to think of somebody. But if some company just went out of business completely, the shareholders don't feel ashamed. They may feel sad or somewhat angry, but then it doesn't affect their personal reputation. So this concept of legally able to separate the two was a very interesting concept. And it, it's not that old. I mean, it's, it's a few hundred years old. So by the way, uh, I was hoping that this was a small enough audience that we could have more interactive Q&A. And it's not like you're going to sit there and listen to me talk for an hour. It'll be super boring. 
So please do raise your hand and do ask clarifying questions or disagreements as we go through this thing. Purpose of this thing, like I said, is to just give you, provide you basic essential information about what is business and how does it work and why should I care? Because all of you somehow will intersect with business. You will start businesses, you'll work at a business, you'll be rejected by a business, or something will happen. There'll be some interaction between you and business. So this is time to learn all about it. Now you might just ask us their yeah. questions because we are filming. I'll okay. try to get to you as quickly as possible with the mic. So do we have anything so far or we are we just 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 sort of laying the groundwork here? All right. So a company, like I said, is a legal entity. It pays on own taxes and it has its own assets and liabilities. So it can shield people. Now realize this is actually a good thing because I'm not afraid to take a risk because if it goes out of business, it doesn't work well, it doesn't hurt me. It hurts this entity called the business. So this was a very fundamental shift by if you can separate and isolate my person from this legal entity, they could be much more adventuresome and try crazy ideas and some of them may even work. If they don't work, I'm not harmed. So this concept is, looks somewhat obvious, but in 1600, this was a novel concept. And it has not been done. So what are the different types of companies there could, could there be? Of course, there we said for profit. And there's different way to organize a company. A corporation. Corporation is the most commonly used form of a legal entity. And of course, there are limited liability company, LLC, you may have heard that name. And there are limited partnerships, and there are limited liability companies. So they're all different, used for different things. So if you're a law firm, you most of the law firm will be a limited partnership. A, a venture fund, like a venture capital fund, will be some kind of a LLP. These companies, the main difference between uh, a corporation of those companies, of course, then they're nonprofits that are these a pass-through entity? Which means that all the profits are passed to the people around them, or do they hold on to the profits so they can do things with them? So LLC, for example, is a pass-through entity. <coughs> and it's very flexible. It's new, so a new concept. And it's, it passes through. S-Corp is a pass-through entity. It has many restrictions that how many shareholders can you have. They all have to be US citizen or uh, green card holders. And they cannot be an entity. Your shareholder has to be a human being. The most flexible and the most commonly used is the C-Corp. C-Corp is extremely flexible. And we have 300 years of law telling us what to do in various scenarios. So if you're going to start a company which is going to take money from other entities, and people, and maybe foreign entities, you have only one option to do a C-Corp. C-Corp is not a pass-through entity. If it makes a profit, it hangs on to the profit. So it can use that to start new businesses or do whatever it seems appropriate to meet its charter. As compared to a S-Corp LLC, it just, money just flows through that. Then everybody who's, who was the owner, they pay their own taxes. So that's the main difference. Any question on this? topic which you, we can spend three hours on this topic alone, and books are written on this topic, so I'm just going to do, I'm giving you all what you need to know. Vicky. So if, uh, do anybody have a question? I'm sorry, can you just clarify what is a, what you call a path-through entity? Uh, yeah, what I'm saying is that it's a, suppose a LLC makes a million dollars in profit. It doesn't pay tax on the million dollars. Because you own 30% and I own 70%, it just, the profit flows through, like a water, through a pipe, to you and me. And then we will pay tax on our portion of that million dollar. You will get a K-1 statement for 300,000. I will get for 700,000. We'll deal with our own taxes. The entity is not paying any taxes. It's like a water flowing through it. But this is, could be bad. Because imagine if Apple was a LLC or a S Corp, which 
can't be an S corp anyway, but suppose it was LLC. Then suppose it, Apple made uh, the r record setting $18 billion of profit last quarter. Then it had to just send that money all the shareholders. But that's not what companies do. Companies want to hang on to that money so they can build new factories, new products. And the C corp is designed to do that. Shareholders, if they want to give money out, they can do dividends, but it's not automatic. So this is how all com any company which takes venture money is a C corp. Any of you want to think about starting a company, there's only one option here, C corp. That's it. You don't do anything else but C corp. Yeah. So when do you have to, have to you know, let's just say, let's just say I were a student, I have a, an idea, we have a team, we're working on it. When do you have to start thinking about if you actually need to form a yeah. company? So many of you will never need to worry about this because you're excellent scientists, researchers, engineers, and this may not question may not come up. But if you're an entrepreneur on that track, when should you start thinking about an entity? And the answer is when you take somebody's money, whether it's a customer's money or an investor's money, the money has to go into an entity. That's when you need an entity. Or th this is sort of more extreme case. A more appropriate case is maybe before that because any intellectual property is being created, you're writing some code, you're designing some hardware, that belongs to the entity, to the company. So you need to set up an entity, so make sure it's, sometimes you can start write code and when, then you have an agreement, when company is formed, then all, you, you assign all the intellectual property to the company. But the answer to your question is before you take somebody's money, either investor or customer. So it's not the first thing you necessarily do, but something you'll do pretty soon after you think about starting. Question in the front. Uh, no, wait. So if uh, all of us would need to form C Corps, what is the use, like which companies would be S Corps or LLCs? It does not apply to you. This will be mom and pop shops. It's, if you're opening a grocery store or something, or you have some, you're buying an apartment building, and then you will do a, a, other. So n uh, none of the other things apply to you. I'm just showing them to you so you don't freak out when you see S Corp. You might mention a law firm. A law firm, we did mention before you came in, we talked about LLPs and LLC and law firms and all that stuff, yeah. But that was mentioned. And law firm could be S Corp too, I guess, if they really want to. All right. So, you know, what I'm saying is this is not, this will give you just enough that you're smart and you can start Googling things. So, and you may heard the word 501c3. This is a form of a nonprofit. There is also 501c6 and other ones, but most likely a nonprofit when the objective is they don't pay taxes, but they're also not trying to make a profit. They're mostly working on donation. That's, a, that's, a, that's the word used here. So like I said, you only one choice to remember if you're gonna start a company is the one where the arrow is pointing. What's a B Corp? I knew somebody was going to ask me that. I was thinking of adding it. So B Corp stands for, this a new, very new concept, like less than five years old. It stands for Benefit Corporation. So there's a new class of businesses starting, which is social business. So these are for-profit business, but they're designed not to maximize shareholder value, but they're designed to address a social will, like a nonprofit, except you get tired of having your hand out all the time. And people get tired of seeing you to have your hand out. What if we can set up a company which is designed to be for profit, but you're not trying to maximize profit? Just enough profit so you can don't have your hand out. And that's the B Corp, the benefit corporation. And that's a pretty new concept. Not everybody knows it, but this allows you to set up a structure which is sort of in between this and this. What's an example of a successful or a, a contemporary example of a B Corp? Uh, there is none, to my knowledge, uh, 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 because it just was only approved like a couple of years ago. So this is too, too early to say. But I can give you an example of some social businesses. I don't know if they were organized as B Corps or not. But I can, you know, they're, if you read uh, Muhammad Yunus, the guy who got the Nobel Peace Prize for Grameen Bank founder, his third book, deals with social business and he lays out the concept of social business. So an example was he gives in the book is that if you're, if you're deaf or dumb, it's kind of hard to enter the job market. So in Bombay, this 
they set up a, a social business as a delivery boy. As a delivery boy, you don't need to have a lot of conversation. Here's your packet, sign here, goodbye. And that just employs deaf and dumb boys. And they started with that idea. Today they have like 300 uh, employees. It's, it's benefiting those people who will otherwise be cut out of job market. And package delivery is just as good if you had ability to yak and chat. Makes a lot of sense. I knew I was in Berkeley. I should have prepared for this one. Yeah. In Stanford, nobody asked this question. <laughs> So I've been noticed, I've been Googling, and it looks like a lot of like sole proprietors or sole, um, they have the LLC after their name. So I know you have the arrow pointing to the S Corp, yeah. but what's the benefit of an LLC for a lot of these really small one person shops? A lot of that is just confusion. There's no obvious benefit. So LLC is a limited liability company, which is set up to, uh, uh, is a pass-through entity, like I described. So a lot of these uh, people who are consultants and whatnot, they could, they somehow feel that, so anybody, by the way, if you want to be in business in this country, all you have to do is just declare, I'm in business. You don't have to file any forms or do anything. All you have to do is in your, when you do your taxes, you fill out a Schedule C, which allows you to share what your income and expenses and you know, you just, that's what you do. So a lot of these people think that by setting up a limited liability corporation, somehow they're reducing their liability. They're creating a shield between them. And the fact is, if you read the rules careful, if a single person, if I'm a plumber, just because I have an LLC doesn't reduce my liability. There are more things apply. But that's commonly misunderstood. So a lot of people set up LLC, think somehow they, and it's a pass-through entity, so you deal with the, with the entities. There's no particular benefit. LLC are interesting if you're doing some kind of a buying real estate together or doing some kind of a partnership. You're starting up something else which is complicated and doesn't fit into any structure. But you guys, again, it's a mental exercise and not appropriate for a good use of your time. If you're going to start a business, you only have one choice where the arrow is pointing. Get over yourself. No, nothing else is applicable to you. Don't worry about it. Because no VC will ever put money in anything but a, 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 a C Corp. Because a, a, otherwise, an entity cannot be a shareholder. And any other people start with LLC unknowingly, end up doing a C Corp. They have to, they're forced into it. It costs the same. There's a lot more body of law for C Corp in this country. Judges know what to do with it. Shareholders know what to do with it. Boards know what to do with it. LLC was invented like 20 years ago, and people are still figuring it out. Okay. So companies, they come in a couple of flavors, private companies or public companies. What's the difference? So public company is where the shares are floated on some stock exchange, and anybody in public, even my grandma, she can buy some shares. So question is, why can't every company be a public company? Answer is, they won't let you. Who is they? They is Securities and Exchange Commission, the government. They want to protect you from people who just will set up a company and try to sell you some shares and defraud you of your savings. They're trying to protect the grandmothers. So there are strict requirements for you to qualify to be float your shares to the public. And there are different stock exchanges. They have their own thing. So if you're starting a business, you should, if you want to invest in a company, you have to be an accredited investor. An accredited investor is defined as somebody having a million dollars of net worth or $200,000 of income annually or more. In other words, they want people who can afford to lose some money. to be, They don't want any, anybody off the street to be talked into investing in a company. So the private company is where it takes capital from select individual or entities, such as venture capital firm, angel investors, and whatnot. But it does not have the strict disclosure requirements once you decide to become public. And how do you go public? You have heard the word IPO, IPO, initial public offering. So when a company goes IPO, they have to spend you know, usually around $3 million to write very comprehensive disclosure called prospectus. 
But they have to disclose all the financial dealing, salaries and stock holding of top five individuals in the company, and a whole bunch of other details, like which market are then, what are the risks. So you have to disclose all that stuff, and you have to continue to disclose every quarter, every year, all kind of personal details. Because the point is that investor, a common person on the street, should have plenty of information to make an informed decision. You can't be conned into one. But in private company, since you don't have to disclose, you can do lots of things. You want to pay yourself a million dollar salary and your board approves, you can. In a public company, you may be scrutinized. Why are you paying yourself so high? So private company is, most companies when you start, they start as private companies. Till they achieve some threshold, and the different stock exchanges have different threshold, only then they're allowed to go public. So typically today in the Silicon Valley, you have to be doing about 40 to 100 million in revenue, have pretty steady customer base before you can go public on NASDAQ or New York Stock Exchange. So I've thrown a lot of data in your direction here. It ought to be causing some confusion. Uh, anything I can answer for you before we move on? All the way in the back. There are a lot of companies that are not turning a profit. In fact, they're actually generating loss. And they still go public, like Twitter before it went public. So I'm assuming for them, there's like a, they have significant user base. So what is that trade off in terms of like, how many users do they need to have? Or like, what type of business model do they need to have yeah. without having revenues or net income? Yeah. So, well, uh, revenue is expected typically, but there was some crazy time when revenues were not expected. Uh, unless you're in biotech field when special rules apply. So short answer is, uh, you, to go public, you hire an investment banker. Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, a bunch of those companies. And they understand the process of taking you public. And if they believe that they, there is a story which an ordinary investor will buy, then they are ready to take public. So in Twitter case, it was obvious, although you don't have immediate uh, revenue, but the potential of revenue is, could be articulated. And people can see, yeah, I can see why, if you start doing this, you can make a lot of revenue. And if they believe the story is sellable, then they'll take you public. But going public, uh, the, the threshold, there are several, uh, if you go to New York Stock Exchange, they have own rules. You have to must meet these rules to go public on New York Stock Exchange. NASDAQ have their own rule. Vancouver has their own rule. So all the stock exchanges have their own rule. Like, you know, Alibaba went public in New York Stock Exchange because they couldn't go public in Hong Kong. That they didn't meet the rule, but they met the rules in New York. So there are a bunch of other nuances about where you go public, but short answer to your question is, you don't have to have a necessarily so much profit, but you need to be a stable company with, 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 and meet the rules, and an investment banker will guide you. So which one was the world's first public company? You may be curious. Anybody knows? The world's first public company. 1602. So this was the world's first from the Dutch East India Company. So who, who, who knew? So this is when the, they were trying to exploit uh, India. And uh, they said, what better way? Let's, yeah, a company. <laughs> actually, this was actually highly valued. At the, it's prime. The company was valued in today's dollar, $7 trillion. The company existed for about 200 years, and then finally went out of business. And they were shipping. They had like 4,500 ships they owned. And they shipped like a million Europeans to, this is how they colonized finally Jakarta and Indonesia. But, India, they were a little bit too late. Portuguese got there before they did. But anyway, started in March, 20th of March, 1602, and it defunct on 31st of December, 1799. So you notice that you know, the company can live longer than the owners. That's why you, the separation was necessary. So by the way, are you able to read this font in the back, or not really? Kind of, sort of, not, not so good? Yeah, well, the young people are thumbs up. Not so young people, not so thumbs up. <laughs> I can sympathize with that. So yeah, I need to bump the font, font here. So a company is, again, organized by shareholders. 
So how do shareholders run a company? I mean, there could be how many shareholders Apple has? Probably millions, I would think. So how do they do that? Basically, shareholders elect a board of directors. So this is what happens. There could be many shareholders. They elect a board of directors, a group of 5 to 12 in very large company, maybe 15. IBM may have 15. But typically, five, seven, nine people to represent their interest. Job of the board of directors is to hire a CEO, its chief executive officer, and give that person, him or her, the responsibility and the authority to execute the mission. Naeem? Yeah. You're on, you've been on boards, or you are on boards. Yes. Can you just take us through how that happened and just uh, your own story? Sure. So in the small companies, like private companies, who are the shareholders? Shareholders are founders of the company and investors of the company, like the venture capital firm. So they are the ones sitting on the board. So when you're a founder of the company, you normally decide in a typical startup company that there's a five seats. So the two founders may have two seats. The chief executive officer may have one seat. And the investors will have one seat, uh, two seats. So it's kind of a, somewhat of a balance. But of course, leaning towards control of the board, investors, when they put money, they want to make sure the person is there. In a big, large public company, the idea is to have some representation from the executive team. But they also want to have independent voices, experienced people who can ask the tough questions. So who was, let's say, who was on the Apple board? On Apple board were Larry Allison was on the Apple board. Mickey, the CEO and founder of Gap, was on Apple board. And some other people, because these are all executives themselves. They have seen the movie before. They don't have to know a lot about Apple's business, but they need to ask some tough, common sense questions. So a board will meet in a large company once a quarter, in a startup once a month, mid-sized company maybe every other month. And this is when five, six of those people come together. And the company management team, led by the CEO, has to present what they're doing. So typical in a startup company, the board meeting will have like four sections. First section is some you know, business update, highlights, lowlights. Second section will be some key strategic initiatives they're working on, like some acquisition, some new product, some discussion around that, what is the status. The, you may talk about sales and customers as your third topic. <coughs> And fourth topic is personnel related. Who do we need to hire? What stock option we need to issue? Do we need to raise more money? So those are the four buckets of topics you discuss. So a board meeting could be as swift as a one hour, but often can lead three to four hours. In a big public companies, there are subcommittees, audit committee, finance committee, compensation committees. They may meet separately and then give their report to the overall board. So those people are picked who are independent from the company. So that's the board structure. And I'm, yeah, I've been on the board when I was a founder or CEO. I'm on some boards now when I was an angel investor or the lead investor. And so in both cases, the format is the same. You talk about company, strategy. The funny thing is, if you go to a slot machine, well, the modern ones, I don't know, but old-fashioned slot machines. How many handles do you have on a slot machines? How many buttons can you push? This is one button, just like this one. You put a coin, you pull the button. So boards are the same way. Boards don't run the company. They only have one handle they can pull. Get the new CEO. When things don't work out, or they're not looking good, they have only one handle to pull. They change the CEO. Who runs the company? The CEO runs the company. What does board do? Boards hires a CEO. So as simple as that. Question. Uh, yeah, for hiring and firing a CEO, is that just a majority vote? And uh, do all board members have an equal vote or an equal share? So board members typically have equal vote. And it, depending on the board, it, it, it should be it's a majority decision. So there could be three to two decision. Obviously, if you're hiring somebody with a non-unanimous vote, you already have problems on the board then. So this is why it's sometime when first thing when Steve Jobs did when he come back, 
<laughs> Actually, his exact word was, I don't have to wet nurse you guys, so please resign. So he, he cleaned up the board. He got rid of the people who were not lined up with him and got new board members. Only Steve Jobs can do that. Normal people can't. So normal people have to put up with that. What about on the other side? When would someone say no to being a board director? Or on a board? Yeah, it's a good board is a legal responsibility. It's a fiduciary responsibility. You, you could be sued if company does the wrong thing. Or your CEO you hired does bad things. You could be sued as a board for hiring the wrong person. So there's a legal liability. That's why you have to buy a director's insurance to protect board members against such activity. But some people don't because being in a board has become much more difficult and not as much fun as it used to be in 70s, 80s, and 90s. A famous law, which hopefully someday will be turned over, is called Sarbanes-Oxley. Sarbanes-Oxley, in my humble opinion, is a horrible law because it was done as an overreaction to some problem which it did not really fix. But that made very hard to be on the board. You're a lot more liability, and it just does, makes you think. So most people say, you know, my life is good. I don't need to be on the board. Thank you very much. Because typically, in a public company, board members get paid some small annual retainer. Like company like Honeywell, Apple, big companies, it's common to have like maybe $20,000 a year as a retainer to be, be in the board meeting, attend like four board meetings. And if you're a part of some special committee, you're chairman of the audit committee, you have some additional compensation for that. Normally, for the small public company, uh, small private companies, before they go public, there's no compensation to be in the board because you're either founder, have founder shares, or you're an investor, and you have investor share. So there's no extra compensation. <laughs> As companies grow beyond the early stages, they want to bring in some independent board member, partly just to make sure that nobody's too dominant, and partly because they want to hear interesting and opinion and perspective from outside people. And then board members, you give them some small stock option, like half a percent to a percent of the company kind of a stock option. But usually no cash. So just to run this thing again, board is not running the company. Shareholders are not running the company. The CEO is running the company. And CEO then hires a chief financial officer and a bunch of other vice presidents who do different things in a company. And we'll look into that in a little bit more detail. Yeah. To be a board member? Well, uh, on a public company uh, or a private company, in a private startup company, incentive is that you are uh, either an investor and, and, or, or, or a founder. But if you get a, talking about a third party outside board member, because uh, you know, you're expanding your sphere of influence. If somebody asks me to be a board member as an independent board member, and other investors are guys from Sequoia or Kleiner Perkins, yeah, sure. You know, hang out with them, go to dinner with them, get to know them on a first name basis. Yeah, it's, good. it's good, it's increasing your sphere of influence. And you get a little bit of stock option. If you can help the company, company grows big, that can be real money. On a public boards, again, it's again sphere of influence and you're, you know, who wouldn't wanna be on an Apple board? You know, it could be fun. You get to see all the inside view. Okay, did we, yeah, we covered that, we covered this. We are so far so good. Varuti, aren't you bored yet? Okay. Because she knows all this thing. Okay, Lucy is there too, I think. I saw Lucy somewhere. Yeah, she is here. All right, so who controls a company? So control, control really is with the board. If you watch too much Shark Tank, people are always fighting over, well, I must have 51%. <laughs> Fact is, it really doesn't matter. Control comes from other, from mostly from board of directors and special other privileges. When people invest in a private company, investors put like venture capitalists, they get a special kind of shares, not normal shares, they get preferred shares. So those preferred shares give them special provisions, veto rights, anti-dilution rights, bunch of other things like that, which allows them to, Neo, hello, goodbye. These are all my students here, that's the problem. I'm gonna see him tomorrow anyway, so. <laughs> so we talked about the private company board, public company board. So shareholders are only responsible for a couple of decisions. 
like to sell the company or not sell the company, to issue additional shares. So in, only on those cases, they have to vote. But most of their decisions about who to hire, who to fire, should we do this merger, or should we buy, do this new product, that's all done in the board meetings. So it's not the shareholder. You can have 60% of the company and still not have the control of the company because you don't have the special rights. So when VCs invest, they're not trying to take usually more than 50%. They may take 40%, but they will have control of the company through board and special privileges and preferred shares. So what kind of people do you need to hire in a company? What exactly goes on in a company? Well, there are all kinds of activities which happen in the company. There could be finance, all the accounting, financial stuff. There's a marketing, product development, customer support. So that's why you see a CEO go out and hire five, three, four, five, six vice presidents to address different functions. In the beginning, you can combine these functions. But as company grow bigger, like you heard of president and CEO. What's the difference between president and CEO? What does president do what a CEO does? So president is inwardly focused. President's job is to run the company day-to-day -day operations. CEO is more outwardly focused. It's looking at customers, the big trends, being a spokesperson for the company, and talking about what the company does and creating an image. So in a small company, it's usually one person does both, president and CEO. In large companies like Intel, president is different and, C and uh, CEO is different because there's so much to do and then you can separate the two jobs. But the corporate structure is, is, is just managing these activities. Anything, anything so far? Question in the beginning. Angat, you know this stuff. Um, so if the board members hold shares, um, could they uh, make wrong, make bad decisions for the company's development but benefit from it um, themselves? You mean like if they have shares and they decide to sell this company, which is not very good for this company, but they could make money. Are you talking about shareholders? Yeah, uh, like board members, if they hold like big shares. Yeah. They want to make money by themselves, but yeah. they don't care about the company's future. So that happens sometimes. Sometimes it happens that a, a board of directors, for their own reason, may want to sell the company or do something to the company which is not good for, you say, for the company. So this means they, are, they, are, they could be sued by shareholders for violating their fiduciary responsibility. But sometimes they can do things which is good for the shareholders, but it's not good for employees, which is more common the case. For example, they may want to sell the company so they can have a profit, but employees did not want to sell. And this is where the control comes into play. And many times, employees will lose. But I've seen the situation when employees all come together to say, if you sell the company, we all quit. And if you all quit, you got nothing to sell. So I've seen that situation that empl employees can revolt against a board trying to do wrong things. So it depends on how much transparency there is among the people and how people know. But so this is just like any king, if you exert too much power, there could be a revolt against you. So you have to be careful how much power to exert without creating the revolt. Otherwise, what happens in France in 1789? Okay. You know the French Revolution. <laughs> Yeah. Hi. So um, say we consider the case that it's a technical or some sort of like technical background company. Usually, what's the background in uh, hiring a CFO? CSO? CFO. C Chief Financial Officer, Chief Strategy Officer, Chief Executive Officer. Finance. Yeah. What's the, what's the objective? Objective is you want to hire somebody. A typical background of a CFO is somebody who has spent a lot of time in the finance department, who understand the basic principles of accounting, or have managed people who are do accounting, somebody who's comfortable with talking with financial projection spreadsheets and understand how the accounting and rules work. In a small company, CFO is often also responsible for administration, which means taxes and compliance, labor laws, other things like that. Human resource usually report to 
chief financial officer in the small company situation. So a typical profile is somebody who came, spent some years in accounting, understood the basic core principles, and have spent more time in finance. So it, it will not be uncommon to take somebody who worked at Accenture or one of those PwC for some years, then join a company as a controller, and then became a CFO. So what happens, how do you start a company, if we were to think about that? Starting a company is a, a, not a complicated process. It could be done in one day. And uh, if you were to, this is not declaring a sole proprietorship when you, can, you don't have to do anything and say, I'm in business. This is when you're setting up a legal entity. So most likely, you hear about it's a Delaware corporation. So you're setting up a C corp. Why Delaware? We live in California. There are 49 other states to pick from. What's so special about Delaware? Just because to show them some respect because they're a smallest state? Well, they're not the smallest, actually. It's cheaper. Cheaper to do what? <coughs> cheaper to file? Low taxes? Low taxes? Not really. No, low taxes, you could be in Nevada or Texas. Fact is, almost all companies are formed in, in Delaware. Uh, and the reason is because Delaware law, first of all, is the most comprehensive in terms of law, body of law, is most favorable to board of directors. It provides more protection for them as compared to California law is a little bit more favorable to employees. So any, all the investors always want to insist they should be Delaware Corporation. But it's cost the same. It's cost the same. Actually, it costs a little bit extra in Delaware because you hire a Delaware agent to do some filing for you. It costs, and to set up a company is like three to $5,000. All the legal paperwork, all the filing, all the lawyer fees. Could be done a little bit less than that, maybe 2,000. And the Delaware is extra seven, $800 because you have to pay some extra fees. So it's not the cheapest, it's the most flexible, that's what people want. So how do you start a company? You basically, sell shares to the founders. Founder put in their idea and the intellectual property into the company, and they're issued shares by the company. Similarly, investors put their dollars into the bucket, and company sells them share. Company, remember, is a separate legal entity. So this is what happened. Founders put their IP, a sweat, into the box. That's the new company. Investor put the dollars. Question. Um, for a company where you have multiple founders putting in their intellectual property into the company per se, how do you determine? How does the company determine what proportion of shares to issue to every individual uh, founder? So this is uh, just like anything else. How do you decide how to divvy up the company entity? And it depends on your relationship with each other, your prior contribution, and the future expected contribution. And it's a discussion among the founders. There is no set rules for that. Some founders come together, two or three founders, that say, we're going to be equal. Because we started this together going forward, they just divided up equally. Some founder says, look, uh, I'm going to be working. Yeah, we've worked together in the past together as graduate students. But I'm going to be CEO initially. And you're only going to work four days a week because you know, you have some other thing going on on the side. You're going to finish your PhD thesis. So then you can say, then we're going to be different. I typically say people that 20% of that allocation is based on prior contributions, and 80% are based on future expected contributions. So just because you work together on an idea doesn't mean that it's necessarily equal depending on what's happening in the future. One guy is going to quit and you know, go back to Brazil, other guy's gonna be hauling his hard work for the last five years, it shouldn't be equal. So this is a discussion which should just openly be discussed between the founders. If that discussion is taking more than a couple of hours, you may want to ask yourself, am I starting with the right co-founders? It should not be a complicated discussion requiring a lot of fighting, because that's a good leading indicator. Things are bad among you, you have other trust issues. So this is how typically a, what is called how a, a ownership of the company. So it was not uncommon 
that after you raise your first Series A, you look like this. So this is the investors will have a chunk, the founders will have a chunk, and you'll set aside a chunk for employees as a stock option or consultants or future board members. So that's how typically a company gets started. So far so good? So how do you start a company and what, how can you educate yourself about this? Answer is you can, my favorite place is go to LegalZoom.com. LegalZoom was set up online by some lawyers and that you could set up a company at LegalZoom for about $300 to $700. I've done that. But if you're starting a company when you're gonna need money, take venture money or investors money, you may wanna spend the two, three thousand dollars find a venture-friendly attorney so you can ask many questions and you can have a more customized solution to you. But if you're just doing something very simple, which you, know, you, you will not have a lot of shareholders and just will be you and your buddy or something simple, then you can even do it there. But if, even if you don't do it, it's a good place to educate yourself. There are all kind of free material which tells you what are your options, what question you should ask. And once you do this, spend this money, you'll get a bunch of legal paperwork so you'll have a corporate filing with state and federal agencies. You have confidentiality or non-disclosure agreements because these are important paperwork for you to have. When you have discussion with other people, you want to make sure you can protect what you're telling them with a non-disclosure non agreement, which prohibits them from disclosing that, what you told them publicly. So if you don't take these precautions, it may be hard to get your company funded later because too many people know about your business, your technology, and you did not restrict them by having them sign a non-disclosure agreement. So some of the biggest mistakes people make is not doing a non-disclosure agreement, and also when they use somebody else to help create some intellectual property, like write some code, your buddy in Oklahoma wrote some code for you, but you never took the ownership of the code into the company, then that they can claim, and and when you're highly successful, but wait a minute, we own 30% of the company. We did all this work. And you see this in movies, uh, people always claiming that they own the company because it was not properly acquired. So things which I always worry about, whenever somebody does some work, make sure I have a consulting agreement and I'm giving them something in exchange for that. Even if it's, you have seen in the movie, somebody says, that, you know, two people are running and they say, I'm a lawyer, but okay, give me a dollar. Okay, now I'm, you're legally my, uh, my client. Now you can tell me everything under attorney-client privilege. What is that dollar has to do with anything? Because that established a legal contract that is done for some consideration. So similarly, when you take intellectual property from somebody who did it even as a favor, you want to give them something, even a dollar, or some stock option or something, so you have ownership, legal ownership of that code. When you have people on e-lance or internet, do some work for you, you always want to do this paperwork so you legally have legal ownership. Why is that important? Because when you start a company or when you sell a company, they, there'll be all kinds of lawyers looking through every, combing through everything to see you have ownership. If you start using my last company, Bitzer Mobile, we were doing mobile security software. So when Oracle was acquiring the company, we spent three months going through every source code, every line, using Black Duck to find any source code. Every source code, every open source we found in, the, in the, our source code, we had to go get a license. We didn't even think about it. We were just like, like crazy developing the product. It took three months just to get where we could not get. We were using the wrong license like GPL. We had to rewrite the code because we could not be acquired with loose open source code. So you have to be very careful what kind of code do you have? What kind of license do you have? Are you using open source? So these things don't become roadblocks for funding the company or selling the company. Any other question? Because I know I'm throwing all kind of a jargon at you guys. In case this caused any confusion, please do ask. Surprisingly, that this side of the room has been either has no questions. Maybe they're so sharp they're getting it, and this side of the room had many questions. Yeah. 
So now the question is, when you start a company, where do you go? And the answer is, it depends how much money you need. Most companies go through developing a prototype to some product development, then deploying the product to first few customers, then lots of customers, and maybe expanding globally. Each one of these stages, you have different requirement for money. So here you may be raising $10,000 to $50,000 just to get a couple of engineers to do something. Then you may need bigger money to develop the product and even more money for development and expansion. So each one of these things, you go to a different source of money. It's not the same person because for you, when you need five, 10, 20,000, it's friends, families, and fools which you go to. And VCs will not talk to you unless you're raising at least two million plus. They, their sweet spot is you know, two to 10 million for the initial funding. So this is when you go to angel investors, which are rich individuals who are willing to fund smaller companies for superior returns. And when you get down to later stage, this is when you go to public markets or private equity, when you have hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars. Yeah, we also have a question in the front after that. Yeah. So what form does this funding come in? Is it in loans or is it just cash or? Remember that it... box? They give you money, you, company gives them stocks. So actual stock certificate, ownership. It could be loan. So there could be some loan, but that's really happens in a special case, especially in early stages, like angels and savings, when you don't know what the company's worth. So I don't know how many shares to give you. So you can do something called a convertible note. Convertible note is a loan which will convert into stock when somebody smarter than us puts a value in the company, like a VC. So you do use convertible note for that. But in general, uh, after that phase, after this phase, is stocks. Now banks, you notice banks are not quite mentioned here, except later when you have cash flow at customers, only then banks become relevant. Why? Because banks need a collateral to give you money. If you have nothing to secure the loan with, they don't want to give you the money. We have two questions. Okay. How does the pie look like as you go from this side to the other side? Congested. Sure, but how does it look like? So on this side, when you're working with your savings, there are no investors. It's just you. So if you're two founders, then it's 50-50, let's say. And as you bring in more people, do you sell your shares to No, the you, you, you make additional shares. So I have a whole example about how dilution works. The question how much time Vicky has for this thing. But short answer is to your question is? Four more minutes. OK. We just issue more shares. So your percent, so suppose you started with, let's say, 2 million shares, 1 million each. Later on, we sold to this investor 2 million shares. Then we just created, you create new shares out of thin air. So your, your number of shares don't change, your percent ownership changes. Yeah, question? What happens when you fail for the investors? What happens, like they invest like millions of dollars in your idea and then it fails? So what happens when you fail? So if the, well, what does that mean, you fail? Because there's a different meaning of failure. But suppose companies shut down or the company yeah. does nothing. Then everybody licks their wound and goes home and starts a new one. Uh, investors just write off that funding as a loss. OK, so that's a loss, right? They're not liable for that money? So Correct. The founders unless are not was, liable? Unless it was a loan, like it shut down right here when you had not issued shares and you were still a loan. Then the loan was secured by the IP of the company. So your investor, your uncle, the investor, now has your code in Python, which he doesn't know what to do with. And he writes it off in his taxes as a loss investment on schedule, you know, you do your taxes schedule D. So you invested $10,000, it became zero. So you take a tax loss. And everybody just expected that, knowing in that you could lose the money, you just take the loss and you shut down the company and you start a new one. So maybe we'll use this as the last slide. Because, uh, I mean, I had more material, but those are more nuanced. Today's purpose was to give you a big picture. So picture, we looked at what is a corporation? How do you start it? What are the shareholders' role? And this company shows you as company starts from an idea and you know, spends a lot of money trying to sort of, you know, can die here. But this is when the angels and friends, families, and fools provide the seed capital. When you get that sad stage, 
Then you go to VCs to raise money, and you raise in tranches. The first money, enough to develop the product. Then more money to start find few customers. Then more money to find many, many customers. So this is called Series A, Series B, Series C, because you're issuing different shares to them with different price attached to them. So every time price changes or other privilege changes, it, you bump, it, you have to call them something else. So you heard about series A, B, C, that will happen in different roles. And VCs have early, who specialize in early stage, and there are VCs who specialize in late stage. And finally, when you get st stable enough, then you approach, have an IPO, you approach the public markets, when you can raise lots of money. Once you go public, it's very hard to die. Because you can always find some unsuspecting people who'll buy your shares and you'll keep raising money. And so once you cross that hurdle, then life becomes different. Probably somewhat simple in many some ways. So I hope that I was able to give you a little bit of big picture. What is a business? What's a corporation? How does it work? What is its function? You know, there's a lot more which you can learn and a lot more we can discuss. And I, I'll stick around to answer any questions. And hopefully, we'll learn more about it as we do this career on ramp. So thank you very much. Naeem, you'll be around for a few more minutes, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. And so the next topic that you're going to be speaking about, I believe, is networking. Yeah, we talk about the art of networking. How do you find people? How do you network them? How do you grow your network in a meaningful way? So we'll be doing several of these topics over the next couple of months. Thank you all very much.